Hello there, and welcome to Success as a Student, a skills podcast for students and anyone who wants to develop key skills that will help them in being successful. My name is Alexander Wood. I create online skills content for the University of Derby. Outside of work, I am a trustee, a chairperson of a youth group, and the University of Derby Graduate of the Year. In this series, we focus on how you can develop skills that will help you to succeed in your university study, your career, and in your personal development, all by interviewing experienced University of Derby staff and successful students. In today's episode, we meet with recent graduate Anisha to discuss her experience as a successful student. Anisha was a very active student who did so much to improve her employability and skill set whilst also helping others. I first met Anisha when she completed a student live talk in front of a huge audience when I was in my second year, and this inspired me to do more, so I hope you feel as inspired as I did when listening to this podcast today. So hello Anisha, and welcome to the podcast today. Before we begin, would you like to introduce yourself to the listeners? Yes, definitely. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me to today's podcast. I'm super excited to share my journey with you guys. Um, So I graduated from the University of Derby in 2019 with a first class Bachelor of Arts Honours degree in English. And my amazing experience at the university led me to studying my Master's in English Literature at the University of Nottingham. So I actually secured a fully funded scholarship for my master's and I graduated in December 2020. Mm. And currently I'm working at the University of Derby in a full time role in the student and graduate experience team. And I'm also working part time at the university as well as a skills advisor. And I just love what I do and I love English so much. And I'm also working part time as an English tutor as well for private tutoring companies. So I work pretty much seven days a week. So yeah, we'll talk about how you managed to manage that and, and balance your studies and your lifestyle. But yeah, congratulations on getting your scholarship. That sounds like a great thing. Uh, Thank you. When you were at university, what opportunities did you do that helped you to get that? Um, So at university, I was just so ambitious to grow and become the best version of myself. And this led me on an incredible journey to working in 28 roles throughout my four years at university. Um, So 11 were voluntary, 17 were paid. Um, Some opportunities included working on BBC Radio, working at Sky News in London, BBC Asian Network, doing a TED Talk. Um, I also became one of the UK's top 10 undergraduates of the year, 2019 for Impact social action which was in recognition of all my work with um, the South Asian community and um, empowering and inspiring young people Um, I also won 24 awards at the university including the Dean's Award a trip to the USA as well and I presented at 13 public events and conferences such as the University of Oxford and the University of Warwick BBC Radio so I just got involved with as much as I could and it honestly just opened my eyes to a whole new world. It sounds like you did a lot. And I remember the first time I heard that when I was uh, an undergraduate student in my second year, I attended your student life talk at a conference that you did. And I was blown away by the amount of things that you did then. And that was uh, two years less into your student journey. And yeah, I felt blown away, but a little bit inspired as well. And actually, I do feel that it was that moment seeing you after... I thought I was already doing a lot and I saw what you were doing. I was like, well, if you're doing this much, maybe I could do more. Maybe here's other ways that I could get involved. And hopefully after listening to this podcast, the listeners today will also agree that they are inspired by you and your story and how you truly got involved and changed and made impact. Um, Thank you so much for sharing that. It's That's really great for me to know about your experience of hearing me speak, because for me, that's what it's all about. It's about making a difference to other people and helping people understand that actually they have the power to achieve their dreams. They have, you know, the ability to go on to do great things. And I'm so happy um, to hear about your feedback from my presentation two years ago. Yeah, I mean, I'd already started turning myself around a little bit by that point. But at that point, I was like, I'm doing loads of things. And I just saw what you were doing and was like, well, I've not done work experience like that. I've not done this. I've not done that. And when you hear people talk about these things, it can sometimes open up barriers that you put in place for yourself and make you go the extra mile. And so, yeah, it's um, it's great to hear things like that. And actually, when I first 
when I did actually first meet, uh, well, not meet you, but first heard you uh, do that talk, it was at a conference called the Student Experience Conference, and that was a huge deal. You spoke in front of, at that point, I think it was about 50 to 100 people about your student journey, and I'm just interested in talking to you about presentations and how you found that. So first of all, how did you feel before doing that talk? So... Before doing that talk, I was actually buzzing. I was really excited. And I think the excitement came from knowing that I could inspire others and make a real positive difference to another student's life. Um, so I guess my confidence came from my ambition to grow, blossom and flourish into the best possible version of myself. And for me, it's always been about you know giving back. So yeah, it's great that I've achieved these successes and accomplishments, but it's for me, it's personally all about actually helping other people to do that as well. Um, so I was really excited to share my story with others and show students that actually this is what you can do actually you're at university. Definitely. And it definitely achieved that effect. Had you done many presentations before that one? Um, I had done a fair few presentations. So I had done various conferences at the University of Derby. So academic conferences like the Literature and Society Conference. Um, but I was just generally interested in my discipline of English, which led me to present at the Punjab Research Conference at the University of Oxford and the International Sikh Research Conference at the University of Warwick. So I had had previous experience of um, presenting in lecture theatres to big audiences and also on BBC Radio as well. So it was an area that I'd been working on since I started university and in my second year, I guess, is um, when I just became a lot more confident doing these kinds of events. Mm. How did you um, develop that confidence? I assume you weren't always full of adrenaline and buzzing. Was it more difficult when you first started or...? Definitely. I think, you know, naturally when you do your first presentation to, you know, an audience of 100 people, you're going to feel nervous, but it's about recognising, OK, I might be scared or nervous to do this, but if I do it, I'll grow, I'll learn, I'll develop. And um, so like you mentioned earlier, it's about identifying your barriers so the first step is awareness. You become aware that there's a barrier that's stopping you from taking a certain action. And then you identify ways to break down that barrier. Because if you don't work on it, that barrier is always going to be there and it's going to limit your potential. So for example, if a student was kind of nervous about presenting, their barrier is the nerves about presenting. And then it's about actually, okay, how can I overcome this? And it's by actually doing it. So put yourself in a situation where you're presenting to a crowd and it doesn't have to be in a crowd of hundred people. It can start off small, maybe in your lecture, you know, say to your lecturer, oh, I've done some research. Could I just have five minutes at the start of a lecture to share my findings with, with students? And I'm sure, you know, your lecturers will be happy to hear this. They want students to engage. So start off small. It doesn't have to be big and daunting. And then as you build it up, you'll realise, actually, I can do this. And you'll have that self-belief and confidence. And before you know it, you could be presenting in front of crowds of 100. So I think really breaking it down into small steps rather than focusing on a really big, daunting end goal. Hmm. I think that's a really good piece of advice there um, to build it small and eventually you would never believe where you can get to in the end. Um, but also when you were talking then you identified that there were certain barriers that students can face and how they should find what barriers impact them and try to get over it. But I would always you know, say to students just try your best to overcome any barriers that you come across because they will lead to more opportunities so for example that um, presentation I did at the university I was approached by staff after that and that led me to presenting at three other conferences at the university so one was the center of student life one was a careers employment service one was student and graduate experience team conference so this one opportunity then led to other opportunities mm. so if you're kind of thinking oh there's no point in me getting involved in that it's just a one-off thing it doesn't matter you don't know who's going to be in the audience and you don't know where it can lead to and you learn more about yourself but you also network and learn about others which leads to further opportunities yeah definitely one opportunity is often a, a passage into a lot of unknowns and if I'm honest, I think actually your appearance on this podcast three years later directly came from that one opportunity because of who was in the audience at that time, which I guess in this occasion was me. Um, and yeah, you'd never know what's going to happen. So don't be afraid to say yes to an opportunity when you don't know what that will mean, because 
it can often open up so many doors. That's a really good point you make that. I really like that. You know, three years later, that one opportunity has led to another opportunity. And that just shows, you know, the power of getting involved and going out of your comfort zone because you all, everyone has kind of a vision of the future. Students kind of have an idea. They might be studying a specific course that goes into a specific career, but it's what you do that really makes a difference between you and getting that dream job. Taking that one step to talk to someone or go to a networking event or do some work experience or an internship you don't know where that can lead to and and that's like it's you know it's like an adventure that's how I describe my past four years of being a student is it's an adventure you don't know what's going to happen you do one thing it leads to something else and just have fun with it is probably something that I would also suggest to students um sure you might be nervous but just think you know what there's no point doing it if I'm not going to have fun. So just enjoy what you guys do. Yeah, putting fun into what you do makes everything better. And especially with presenting, I find if you aren't having fun, the audience probably aren't going to enjoy what you're saying. So if you can find a way to make it fun and interesting, then it makes it so much better. Definitely. And they go. that's the same for taking opportunities. Something that you just mentioned then is that one opportunity can lead to lots, but also one decision so that decision about whether you go and present at one event can lead you to somewhere which you never thought you would go to. Was there ever one moment for you that you thought was that moment that opened you up to lots of other things? I would say overcoming one of my barriers. So I've got a story I'd like to share with you guys. Um, so one of my barriers was kind of staying away from home. So I stayed at home throughout my undergraduate degree and throughout my master's. I've always lived at home with my family. So going somewhere on my own was very daunting, somewhere like for a certain, like a long period of time. So I remember my first year at university, I came across this opportunity to work at Sky News in London, Sky News headquarters. And I actually didn't think I, I would get it because I thought, whoa, it's Sky News, you know, I'm only a first year student at university, like they're not going to give it to me. But again, I thought, you know what, that's a barrier. I'm limiting myself. Mm. Let me apply. Let me take the action. So I took the action, took the step and, you know, I, I got the position. Then I had a very difficult decision to make because I had to go and stay in London for a few weeks over summer in order to do that placement. And um, me being someone who's never lived on my own before, wasn't overly familiar with London, to be honest, only been down a few times. I was completely in the unknown. I was on my own in a city I'd never really been to that much, working in a new workplace, not knowing any people, family, friends or relatives there, you know, there was no one. And that really opened my eyes and gave me confidence that actually you can do this. So sure, I was nervous. I was scared. I was driving down to London with my parents and I was a bit like, oh, I don't know if I can do this. But you know what? You just you do it and you realize how much you grow as a result. And that really taught me the power of stepping out of your comfort zone. Um, you know, things seem scary and our minds tend to make them scarier than what they really are. Because after that experience, I came back to Derby and I said, like, oh, that's fine. You know, <laughs> it, it wasn't as bad. Um, so I hope you guys, that actually helps you to understand that going out of your comfort zone and doing things that would scare you ultimately leads to you growing and becoming better and actually embrace the unknown because mm. the unknown is where you actually realize what your true power and potential is and um, so try and go out of your comfort zone and into the unknown as much as possible it sounds like you've got a growth mindset and it's really good that you're able to spot that that was something that was limiting you I know that when I was uh, in my first year, I didn't spot what was limiting me and I just let it limit me. I think my barrier was I'm doing a really big degree. I, I can't possibly do anything alongside of it. I need to spend all my time focusing on it. Having the mindset to know that's a barrier and then the perseverance to try and overcome that is really important. So yeah, definitely stepping out of your comfort zone, really, really important. Um, yeah, and going back to the point you made earlier about things leading to other things. So that was my first experience living on my own for a long period of time without anyone. Um, that then increased my confidence to do things that came down later on the line mm. a few years ago that obviously at the time I wasn't aware of. So, for example, I 
made it to the finals of the undergraduate of the year awards for impactful social action and that involved me having to go down to London quite a lot for the interview for group assessments for presentations for the award ceremony and if I hadn't have had that experience in London working at Sky News that barrier I'd still have to overcome that but at a later date the fact that I, I overcame it within my first year of university meant that in my third year when I had to make frequent trips to London, it wasn't daunting, it wasn't scary. And also after my third year in the summer between my third year and my master's, I worked um, at the BBC Asian Network in Birmingham and London. And when I was working in London, it often involved me staying overnight. And again, I was perfectly fine. I was confident it didn't phase me because I had done it two years prior. So you don't know what life has in store for you in the future. So you keep might keep cutting off barriers you know you might think oh you know it's fine I won't bother doing it but somewhere down the line you are going to have to overcome it so why not overcome it as soon as possible it's really interesting because that's an indirect link so rather than directly linking so with the oral talk that you did people approached you directly from that talk whereas this yes the, you overcoming that barrier opened up an opportunity later because you didn't have that barrier in place and so things might not link a to b but they may help you get there like you did with this uh, opportunity of going for those awards so yeah definitely yeah because my main barrier was that whole kind of being like on my own in a new city in a new place and another example i can give of the way that that barrier was knocked down was the university's international travel awards so i was chosen to go to america so to washington dc and new york city with the university for a week and a half and again that's something that if someone had said that to me earlier i'd be like go in a port on my own with you know people i don't really know how could i ever do that but Obviously, I'd been working on that and it obviously ultimately led to, you know, a trip to New York where we did incredible things and visited the United Nations. And it's just incredible how at the time you might be scared, but when you look back and you reflect, you actually realize how each step in your journey is like a piece of a jigsaw puzzle. And at the time, you've just got a piece of the puzzle. You can't see the whole wider picture. But as the years go by, as time goes on, you're able to formulate and see that bigger picture. And that's when you realise, actually, just just go for it. Mm. Do you think it helps looking back and reflecting on that picture? Do you think it helps you now? It definitely does. Like having these kind of conversations with people when I'm sharing my story, I'm always learning about my own story. So I might be sharing it, but I'm also actually, you know what, that led to that. And that experience taught me this. Um, so I think reflection is a very important thing. You know, get if some people like to work on diaries, some like to have journals, whatever works for you, just reflect um, on every experience you go through and you'll realise you'll keep reflecting on it as time goes on because you'll see it from a different perspective, a different lens. I, that's how I do it. I use a diary. Uh, another way to reflect, I guess, is having conversations with people, but just yeah. thinking through how you've done things. I find it super useful. So I'm glad that uh, you also see that see the same way that I do in terms of the usefulness of reflection. I have one more question for you about confidence and presentations, and that is, do you have any advice for how other students could learn the skill of presenting? I would recommend students to just go for it because what can happen is we overthink. So we think I have to read books on presenting. I have to watch videos. I have to do X, Y, and Z. And then when you see people doing that, you think, wow, they're so good because they're professional. They've written books in these fields. They're doing videos about them. And that can give you a reason not to actually do it. Mm. So I would say instead of wasting time playing around with it, thinking, should I, should I not being double minded? Just take the action. Identify a, an area where you can do this. You know, even if it's asking a lecturer to have five minutes to present a topic, just do it because your thoughts can sometimes prevent you and stop you from taking the action. And what's important is action. Once you've taken the action, you've actually broken down that barrier. So why spend weeks reading up on it, watching videos when you actually, in a day, you can take the action, that's it, your barrier's gone. Mm -hmm. Then if you want to learn how to improve, read books, watch videos, fair dues, that's what they're there for. But I'd say initially, just, just take the step, take the action. 
So go out and get yourself a foundation and don't spend too long overthinking it. And yeah, I can totally see why people would do that. Um, Early on in the series, when I was talking about growth mindset, um, we discussed about how people view successful people as just that, successful people. They often see the the failures and the struggles that, that they've gone through to become successful. And if you look at presenters who do TEDx talks, or for example, yourself, you've done a TED talk, you yes. could think easily wow, they're amazing. I can never be like that. Look, that's how they present, but I'm sure they develop that skill over time. So as a TED presenter, did you feel that if you thought about your first presentations now that you are no, you were nowhere near the level that you're at now? Oh, definitely, yes. When you first start presenting, you don't know where, where it will lead to. So I never imagined that I'd be presenting at conferences in front of hundreds of people. I never imagined I'd be sharing my story, doing a podcast like this, doing a TEDx talk about women's empowerment. You know, a lot of the events I've spoken at have involved um, empowering other people. So I've done International Women's Day events at conferences and events across the country. And I used to be the person going to those events and seeing people share their stories and learning from them. Little did I know that I'd actually be the person on the stage actually delivering that. Um, so you just don't know where it will lead to it. And, and it's and it's so rewarding and fulfilling to actually be able to help somebody else because I don't believe if it just starts and ends with you, it's not the right thing. It always has to do. For me, it's always about giving back and helping others because if I can do it, so can everybody else. And if my story can help others, if me being open and honest about it can help others, then there's nothing bigger for me um, and more rewarding to do. Yeah, definitely. I, I agree. If you can help someone else, then that's a huge, a huge deal. And hopefully anyone listening to this podcast can now feel that they can go out of their comfort zone. They can push their selves. They can see an opportunity and just go for it and go get over a lot of their barriers that might come in their way. However, one barrier that people may often use or cite as the reason that they can't take an opportunity is time and the fact that they have no time to do things. And they may have different reasons for this, but having looked at what you've done, you said you did over 20 different roles whilst just studying at university. How did you manage to get involved with so many things whilst studying? I get asked that question a lot. That's like the top question I get asked because I worked in 28 roles 13 events and conferences and yeah it, it just sound a bit like wow how is that possible but guys it is possible um I think for me it was being passionate so I'm really passionate about everything I do so whatever I do I give it my full 100% and I really care about it and I really love it and I have that passion for it so I think identifying what you guys are interested in what you find you know, motivates you is really important. So I was passionate about my course, first and foremost, I really loved English. I really loved um, also my religion and my culture. So my Sikh faith, my Punjabi culture, and I had the opportunity to explore this on my degree which then led me on to a journey of presenting this research at, you know, the University of Oxford and other universities across the country. So for me, it always started off with kind of like my passion and my hobby mm. and then extending this out in, in other areas. So extra quick opportunities like the BBC, I, you know, being part of the BBC for the last five years, I do the music review on the Sunday evening Asian show. I enjoy it. It's, you know, a way for me to express my passion. Um, so everybody has, you know, their own passion, their own hobbies, their own interests. And I think they're kind of hints to what your calling and purpose in life is. So identify something you enjoy and pursue it. It might just start off as a hobby, then it might lead to something more serious. But I think, yeah, you've got to have that passion at the core of, of why you do things and that will then motivate you to work long days because I was studying pretty much studying was my priority obviously I wanted to get my first class degree and I did and I prioritized studying so that was my priority which meant I was working long days um little sleep working weekends no real breaks maybe the odd hour or the evening but I would never take days out but I think for me because I enjoyed my work so much it didn't feel like work Mm. 
I think it is uh, definitely really important to say to have that passion and enjoyment in what you were doing. If you are listening to this, don't feel like you have to definitely start off by just going straight to your level, Anisha. Uh, they could, if any, if you do any improvement, um, then you can do. Then that will definitely help your CV. That's what I did. I didn't go straight to the crazy levels of not having any spare time, but I built up to doing more and more uh, in a way that worked for me. Uh, but do you have any like techniques that you use to make sure that you can fit everything in? I am a very organized person. So I have all my notes, my diaries, my notebooks, and that's how I work. So I basically just listed out what I had to do. So I'd always start off by listing um, course related things. So do I have a deadline? Is there any extra reading I need to do? So I'd make a list of all my activities and then I'd write the deadlines next to them, which will then help me realize, okay, time frame, what are we looking at? And then what I would do is I would schedule in my week. So I'd get my diary, writing when I'm in class, when I'm in lectures, writing when I'm working, what times I'm at work, and then all those kind of the extra reading or extracurricular opportunities or volunteering I was doing, I'd pencil in around that. And for me, that helped to actually visually see this is my plan for the week. This is what's happening at these specific times. And if I stick to it, you know, this work will all get done. Um, but with that, you've got to appreciate that not everything goes to plan. Um, things It's very unlikely that your whole week will go exactly how you've planned it. So that's where you need to be adaptable. You need to be able to be in the flow because some essay work might take you double the amount of time. You just don't know until you get into it. So it's having that awareness that actually I'm not going to beat myself up if it doesn't stick to to the plan um, and you just kind of adjust and reevaluate your plan so a mixture of planning and organizing but also being in the flow mm. i agree not over planning is definitely important i do plan my weekend just as you do it i guess um so i have a regular monday morning action in my calendar where i plan my time out for the rest of the week and then i go with that but it's important, as you were saying, to um, make sure to be flexible with that so that if, if an opportunity comes your way, for example, that you really want to do, you can take the opportunity. And also to make sure that you can account to do your studying as well. So something that you did a lot of um, when you were a student is you got involved with lots of different internships. And I was just wondering if you had any advice for students who were looking to get and find internships. Firstly, I would say be open to the opportunities that are out there because students sometimes studying a specific course are looking for a specific internship. So, for example, a student on a teaching course would want an internship in a school. But actually, there might be internships in charity organisations or, or the businesses or in the university that aren't directly related to your field or your course, but they can still open up transferable skills for you which are essential in any kind of course um so for example i've done loads of internships in media so the bbc sky news i've also done internships in teaching so derby pride academy school in derby i worked there as a welfare support worker i've done internships at the university in projects and event management um so i've actually that they're three different areas education academia and journalism and they all have transferable skills that there's not it's not like you know I'm, I'm doing this particular course I can only do an internship in that area you will learn so many skills from doing internships in different areas um so I would highly suggest you know don't limit yourself be open-minded to the different types of internships that are out there actually I totally agree with that I think you doing that will also have another benefit that you might not have even thought of, which is it makes you unique. It makes you have this unique element to you. So when you go for jobs, you don't have the same experience that everyone else going for the job might have. If they've been diligent and got got themselves an internship, it, let's say they're working in education, they may have had one in education, whereas you may have had one in other areas that will give you new skills that will make you stand out and be different. And when you then get into the, that role... Uh, a different offer to the average person in your area and so yeah I think that's a really really important thing to do yeah and just to echo that point as well I have loads of different CVs I've got my overall master CV which is like 10 pages of everything but then I have a teaching CV a journalism CV an academia CV 
I have like separate CVs for those specific areas. So if I do get an opportunity in academia, I've got the CV for that. I've got an opportunity in journalism. I have a CV for that. So it's almost as if, you know, I could go into a job in all of these different areas because I've not limited myself to a specific area. I've stayed open. Um, so that's one tip I would give you guys is stay on top of your CV as well. But also you have to kind of tailor it according to the specific area you're going into as well. Mm, I totally agree with that, um, especially with someone as much experience as yourself. You will have to sometimes miss things that you've done off, uh, which yeah, you can definitely. then bring in the interview as a surprise. Like, look, I've done this as well. But um, having that master CV, the 10 page one, I'm sure it is helpful that when you do tailor things, uh, when you do tailor a CV to be perfect. But yeah, I've never even thought about having multiple different CVs. I've just got my master one that I then edit and reduce down in size for each different interview I go for. Uh, but yeah, I think that's a really good idea. I might have to do something like that myself. Yeah, it definitely does help. So with these internships, I'd be interested to know, how did you find all these internships? Where did you go to look for them? So the University of Derby actually offers loads of different internships. So if you guys are struggling with where to go, that's a good first call. Um, so they do something called the on-campus internship. So I was involved with those for two years whilst I was at university. And that's a good way of getting experience of working at the actual university itself in different areas. So one of my internships was with the wellbeing department working on their marketing material. Another one of my internships was with the registry. Um, so there's a good variety. So that might be a good starting point. And then the university also have a scheme which was previously called the Derby Internship Programme, but it's now called Driven, where they have opportunities with local employers. So when I did my internship at Derby Pride Academy Secondary School, that was through the um, Driven scheme at the university. So I got the opportunity to work at that school. So it was in collaboration with the university. And then I even came across opportunities external to the university um, working at the BBC. So the BBC Asian Network was a paid internship that I did for a few months between my undergraduate degree and my master's degree. Um, and that's something that I just kind of come across on the BBC website. So just stay open um, to what the university offers. You get loads of emails from careers, so it's worth checking them out. And if there's a particular industry or company you're interested in working at, there's no harm in subscribing to their newsletters and checking their email, um, their websites and their socials on a regular basis. Mm. I definitely agree with that. Um, I def I uh, follow a number of different uh, organisations that I on LinkedIn, and I see lots of jobs coming through on that. That's one of the ways that I find mine. But yeah, the internships through the university can be really useful, uh, especially when, as you said, being you're open for them, and you don't fix yourself in. I know with me, I was a law student, and so I was looking at first for just law opportunities, and there isn't many. Uh, but if you start making yourself wider, as I'm sure you did you'll get experience that, as I said before, gives you a unique selling point. So yeah, I think that's really important. But it can be very difficult if you do go for one of these internships and put your heart and soul into it to be rejected. So I was just wondering, Anisha, if you have any advice for what to do if you do get rejected when going for one of these internships? Yes, and that's a big concern that a lot of people have is, is failure and rejection. And the way I see failure is, you know, I think that each letter of failure stands for first attempt in learning. So when you fail, it's actually just your first attempt in learning. There's no limit to the amount of attempts that you can make. So I think actually being mature about failure and rejection is important. Acknowledging, yeah, yeah that this is going to happen challenges are there for a reason they help you to grow and become the better version of yourself so one particular story about rejection that I can share with you guys is um, in my second year of university I applied for a internship at BBC Asian Network um, it was a paid internship working in their um, team and I was rejected I didn't make it through to the interview so you take your experience you take the experience you apply you give it your best shot and if it's not meant to be, I'm kind of like, okay, you know, on to the next thing. Don't dwell mm. too much on it. Don't kind of go down in the dumps. You keep moving forward. There's other opportunities. Exactly a year later, the same opportunity came about. I applied for it, got through to the interview, and I actually got the job. <laughs> so whereas one year I'd been rejected and even get an interview, 
the exact year later, I actually got the job. And then I did so well in the job, they gave me a freelance contract to carry on working for them. So don't be put off by rejection. If it's, you know, a company that you're really interested in or a particular role that you really see yourself being in, but you've been rejected, keep taking action, keep moving, keep progressing, keep improving your skill set and apply for it again. And I hope my example shows that actually failure helps you to grow. I'm glad that happened. I'm glad mm. they rejected me first because when it, I actually got that position, I was much in a be better position. I had more experience. I was more confident. The timing of it was a lot better. It was in that time as I finished my degree and was before I was about to start my master's. So when you look back in hindsight, you understand why it's happened and it makes sense. So if you are going through rejection or failure at the moment, just understand that it's temporary. I know it's annoying, but you will look back in the future and you'll be thankful that it actually happened so so kind of just think a step ahead what is this trying to teach me how can I be better yeah I think that's really really good advice and it's inspiring I'm sure to lots of people who are listening and it's I just feel like if you when I got rejected at least at first my first reject because I felt very bitter about it and you'd see who got that you could see who got that role and you feel a bit down about it. And actually, if you just keep going and know that that rejection was for a reason, and it's not personal. They don't reject you because of uh, because of anything personal about you. Sometimes they only reject you because they had so many great applicants that they had to make a decision. Often, especially in the climate now, people there might be 50 people going for a job and it doesn't mean that you weren't good enough to do it. It just means that there might be someone who they specifically chose. So yeah, great example there of perseverance and being able to get achieve something that initially you couldn't achieve uh through and then growing and getting better and then getting it in the end so i have one last question for you and it's a question that i ask every single person who comes on this podcast but it's always interesting to see how people respond differently to this question and that question is what advice do you have for being successful as a student in one word it'll be passion follow your passions your passions are your passions for a reason that you're calling in life and if you follow them you'll soon become aware of your purpose so one thing I've learned is that the things I enjoy the things that I'm passionate about are actually leading me down a certain path and as I embark on that path as I go on that adventure I'm very successful and things are in the flow it's effortless I don't have to work hard things naturally happen um so follow what you enjoy because that's an indication of what you're here on on this planet to do um, and my second piece of advice is fail actually just means first attempt in learning so don't be afraid of failure and rejection it's natural see it as an opportunity for you to grow and become a better version of yourself and a quote that I just like to share it's my favorite quote being a Disney fan is um, if you can dream it you can do it and it's by Walt Disney so Go and pursue your dreams and have fun. I feel like we spoke about Disney loads on this podcast. Uh, we spoke I about... know. I, I've mentioned a few, you know, Into the Unknown. We mentioned a whole new world just in conversation. <laughs> I've been like, yep, yeah, those are Disney songs that we've just brought in there. Well, this is a fact from another episode. Um, did you know that Walt Disney was actually fired for not having enough imagination? Yes. And, and look at it now. It's probably the w most famous brand in the world everyone pretty much knows about it so i'm glad you shared that if you guys listening you know he was fired so honestly you can do anything you want to that isn't from me though that's that's from associate professor melanie pope who said that uh but it links quite a lot to the, you mentioning how you weren't able to get that role in your first attempt but you persevered and you grew and then you were successful so yeah, thank thank you very much, Anisha, for coming onto this podcast and being interviewed. I really enjoyed it, and hopefully, students will be inspired by your story uh, just as much as I was when I was in my second year. Thank you so much for having me, and you know, very well done to you as well for doing these series of podcasts. They're amazing to listen to, and I'm sure they'll add a lot of value to students. So thank you. Thank you. Clearly, Anisha is a great example of someone who goes over and above to develop and improve. I am always amazed as to how she does so much. However, don't feel as if after listening to this podcast that you need to go to Anisha's levels to find your version of success. 
If you can find time to do something more that will help you to develop, then that's amazing and just one small step can help you in increasing your skill set. This links to the first key point from this episode. Anisha recommended putting your degree as your first priority. If you have any more time then use that to gain experience, but your degree comes first. I agree with this approach and I would always prioritise deadlines, lectures and tutorials over taking opportunities, unless that opportunity is amazing. The second key point leads on from this, and that is to plan your time out over the course of a week, a semester and so on. Anisha suggested penciling in, volunteering and extracurricular activities around the fixed lectures, tutorials and deadlines that you have. Finally, Anisha highlighted that you can learn lots of transferable skills from doing experiences in different areas. Have a growth mindset and don't restrict yourself to the opportunities that perfectly align to your course. Doing this will make you appear unique and will also give you lots of different options in your future. Thanks again to Anisha for taking the time to be interviewed and for sharing all of her advice. This episode was brought to you by the University of Derby skills team. Production, episode planning and editing was completed by Alexander Wood. Thanks to Stephen Plant for creating the amazing graphics and for balancing the audio. And to Lily Kent for transcribing the series. Thanks also go to Natalia Kodalavar and Naomi Bowers Joseph for giving feedback and helping in the planning of the episodes. Thank you very much for listening.